talk to you today about um, conscientious objection in healthcare. And as you may be aware, there's a quite a debate going on now in medical ethics about whether doctors should have a moral or legal right to decline to perform treatments like abortion or contraception or physician-assisted suicide, etc. So what I wanted to talk to you about is basically um, the main objections that are raised against conscientious objection. In other words, the, the main reasons that people give why the doctors should not have a right to refuse to provide whatever treatment. And so basically that talks to me divided into three uh, different parts. I'm going to talk about objections from rights of patients. And secondly, objections from consequences. And thirdly, objections from alleged inconsistencies. So those are the three kind of, kinds of parts. So the first part is objections from the rights of patients. And rights are typically divided into two different categories. Uh, moral rights on the one hand and legal rights on the other hand. And so if we think about objections in terms of legal rights, at least in the United States, there is currently a legal right of healthcare providers to refuse to provide certain treatments. So in 1973, uh, right after Roe versus Wade was handed down by the Supreme Court, the uh, US Congress passed laws that basically protected healthcare providers, doctors, and nurses from being forced to perform abortions. So basically, the current law is that if you're a pro life doctor, pro life nurse, you do not have a legal obligation to do that. So to put it in different terms, no patient has a legal right to force a pro-life physician to, for instance, perform abortion. Similar protections are in place for uh, physician-assisted suicide, for contraception, and for some other treatments. On the other hand, you might think of the um, objection from patients' rights, not in terms of moral rights, um, but rather in terms, uh, or not in terms of legal rights, rather, but in terms of moral rights. Now here, I think things get a little more complicated. Um, if abortion, and I'll, I'll use abortion as the running example, but just substitute physician-assisted suicide or whatever. Um, but if abortion, for instance, is not ethically permissible, then there is no moral right of a patient to get an abortion. Just like if slavery is wrong, there's no moral right to own slaves, if raping children is wrong, there's no moral right to rape children. Uh, if stealing is wrong, there's no moral right to steal. So a moral right is uh, the right to, or there can be no moral right to do what's morally wrong to do. That's just a contradiction in terms. Because a moral right typically is understood as a lack of a duty to refrain from something. But if the thing in question is wrong, well then there is a moral duty to refrain from it. So it's kind of a contradiction. Um, but let's for, assume for the sake of argument that um, abortion is ethically permissible. Just assume that for the sake of argument. Then the question is, is the right in question a liberty right, or I'm going to back up or something. Cool. Yeah, we'll take over. Yeah. Hi, guys. Sam. Is the right in question a uh, liberty right or a claim right? Um, is, anyone, is anyone familiar with these? Just let me go over what you're saying. So, um, a liberty right is an individual's lack of a duty uh, not to do something. So for instance, I have a legal liberty right to speak if I have no legal or moral duty not to speak. Um, by contrast, a claim right is a duty that other agents have to refrain from doing something against me or to supply me with something to which I'm entitled. Now, could a patient have a liberty right to an abortion? Uh, well, abortion is ethically permissible. It's possible that they have a liberty right to abortion. But the thing is, liberty rights don't entail the duty of anyone else to cooperate. So, for instance, I have a liberty right to free speech. But it doesn't fall from that that uh, MSNBC or Fox News or whoever has a duty to cooperate with my right to free speech and to facilitate it. So if abortion is construed as a liberty right, then it's the sort of right that other people, like healthcare providers, don't have a duty to cooperate in liberty rights aren't about that. On the other hand, what if abortion is ethically permissible and understood as a claim right? Now, if it's a claim right, that would mean that other agents would have a duty to facilitate that. 
But if abortion is a claim right, and other agents do have a duty to facilitate that, it still doesn't fall that a pro-life physician would have the duty to facilitate that. Because it could be that someone else has a duty to facilitate it, but not this particular physician. Um, offering another kind of uh, argument for the same conclusion, some have written that, quote, we are not entitled to impose our values on patients in the delivery of health care. And to deny a treatment when these patients are not <coughs> entitled to access that treatment is to impose your values on others. Um, but I think this is a misleading way of characterizing um, conscientious objection in healthcare. So, for instance, a pro life doctor, in fact, does not impose her values on the patient. Patients in the United States are legally free to get an abortion from another healthcare provider. And the fact that conscientious objection to abortion has already been in place in the United States since 1973 has not, we can see from the evidence, inhibited or prevented people from getting abortions. Abortion is one of the most common medical procedures in the United States, and every single year there's between 1.5 to 900,000 abortions performed. So this is not as if, you know, somehow conscientious objection has prevented people from doing this or conscientious objection is imposing your values on others. So all those are, right, are arguments from the rights of patients, but let's consider now objections from consequences. Many people try to to undermine conscientious objection in healthcare by appealing to the consequences that would come from allowing conscientious objection. Um, one of those consequences has to do with assessing. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, before you go too much further, can you explain the difference between a moral right and a liberty right? Again, can you give like, an example of each one? Just so that yeah, so the, the, the distinction I was making was between a moral right and a legal right. So what's the difference there? So a legal right would be where there's no, for instance, corresponding duty not to do something. So for instance, I have a legal right to free speech. A moral right is that there's no corresponding moral duty not to do something. Now those two things are different. So I can, I, in the United States, say I have a legal right to say the N-word. Right? It's not against the law. But do I have a moral right to do that? Well, I don't think I do, because I think I have a moral duty not to say the N-word, for instance. So even though what is moral and what is legal, there's some overlap. There's a lot of things that are both legally wrong and morally wrong, stealing, say. Um, they don't overlap perfectly. So there are some things that are merely matters of legal prescription that really, morally speaking, there isn't any necessity to them being the way they are. For instance, in the United States, taxes are due on April 15th, and that's just a legal stipulation. It could have been July 5th or due, December 30th. There's no real reason as to be April 15th. It's just a better legal uh, determination. Just like driving on the right side of the road rather than the left side of the road. It's just a legal determination. And on the other hand, there are some things that are near, you might call them merely moral matters. So for instance, um, every Sunday I give my mother a call. Why? Because my mom said to me a few years back, you don't call enough. I, need, I want to hear from you. I said, okay, I'll, I'll call you. So I thought every Sunday I give her a call. And she likes that, and I like it, so it's great. But that's not a a legal duty, obviously. I, I don't think we should make a law. Everyone needs to call their mother every Sunday just to make a sure rep or something. So it's great to cheer up your mom, but it shouldn't be a legal duty. Um, I think I have a, a duty and responsibility to pray every day. Um, should it be a, a law that everyone has to pray every day? Well, no, of course not. That's something that is a moral responsibility, but not a legal responsibility. So, so the moral and the legal, I think, definitely do have an overlap. There are things that are both. And, but then there's some things that are mere legal determinations, and some things that are real moral matters. So that's one distinction. Now the different distinction is the distinction between a liberty right and a claim right. And you can talk about um, the right in question here as being either legal or moral, or in some cases both. But the difference between a liberty right and a claim right is this. A liberty right is the absence of a duty, for instance, not to do whatever it is. So for instance, if I have a, a legal right to, um, to marry, that means that there's no legal duty I have not to get married. Right? Or if I have a legal right to free speech, it means there's no duty for me to abstain from speech. So. A claim right, by contrast, is often where someone else has a responsibility to provide me something. So if you say you have a right to health care, well, that's a claim right. That is to say, if I have a right to health care, that's another way of saying someone out there has a duty to provide me health care, right? 
So it's not just me alone fighting liberty or I could be, or I do my own thing alone. But rather, the same right involves us that others typically have responsibility to provide something to me. Um, so anyway, so those are the two um, two distinctions I use. The distinction between a, a legal right and a moral right, and the distinction between a liberty right and a claim right. But basically, and the argument basically was, no matter how we take it, um, the idea that patients have a, um, patients, the rights that patients don't entail, even taking a couple four different ways of thinking about rights, don't entail um, that a pro-life physician, for instance, must provide an abortion. Um, so now I was looking at the second section, which has to do with objections from consequences. And one of those objections has to do with assessing the interests of the patient and the interests of the physician. And basically the argument goes something like this. Um, a physician's ethical responsibility is to place patient's welfare and interests above the physician's own self-interest. So it's, see this kind of appeal to interest. And the idea is kind of a balancing. And that's why this is kind of a consequential struggle. We say, well, you know, the, the rights of the patient are more important should trump the rights of the physician. And in a certain sense, there's some truth to that. But where that argument goes wrong, I think, is by absolutizing the interests of the patients as if they always trump the interests of the physician. And I think if we think about it, it's clearly not the case that the interests of the patients always trump the interests of the physician. So for instance, it would be in a patient's interest if doctors always made, always made house calls. But there's no obligation or responsibility that, that or the interests of the patients always trump the interests of the physicians. It might be in a, in a patient's interest to um, have free medical care, but that doesn't trump the interest of the doctor to make a living off providing medical care. It might be in the interest of the patient to be seen on Saturdays and Sundays, and so doctors would never have time off. But, you know, the interests of the physicians do trump, you know, the interests of the patients in terms of, you know, being on call 24 hours to, to provide services and stuff. So then the question would be, what is the interest of the doctor in not doing things that violate conscience? And it seems to me that the interest of the doctor in not doing things that violate, violate conscience is extremely high. That is to say that for someone to act against their conscience, for instance, for someone to do something they consider very seriously wrong, is arguably the most serious harm that a person can undergo. At least that's what Socrates thought. Socrates famously said, that it's worse to do evil than to suffer evil. He said it would be better for you to get murdered, for instance, than to be a murderer. Now, if Socrates is right, that it's worse to uh, do evil than to suffer evil, then the person who goes against his or her conscience is undergoing the most serious kind of harm that can be undergone, doing evil, at least what they believe to be evil. So if we allow the interest of physicians to override the interest of patients in some circumstances, then it seems if we think of conscience, uh, not violating one's conscience as something that is incredibly important to self-interest, then it would seem to fall that if we allow these lesser self-interested uh, things like um, getting paid or getting time off or not making house calls, uh, if we allow those sorts of considerations to trump patients' interests, then the interest of a physician in not um, yeah, doing something that goes against conscience would also trump. Another objection is, if we allow conscientious objection, it's going to be chaos. All hell is going to break loose. We're not going to know. People won't know where to get their their um, you know their medical treatments, and it's going to be too burdensome and hard to, to deal with. And that objection, I think, is disproven by um, the facts of the case, that we have, in fact, had conscientious objections since 1973. In fact, all chaos is not broken up. Right? People still get abortions, contraception's available at every gas station in the United States, practically. And these, these things are not as if people can't, can't get these sorts of things, and you know, it's not as if chaos is broken up. Um, another objection from consequences has to do with the claim that if we allow conscientious objection, this is going to result in suboptimal health care for patients. That is, that if we allow conscious objection, the health care that patients um, seek, it's going to be suboptimal. They're going to have to, for instance, travel longer than they otherwise would to get whatever they want to get. Um, they're going to have to, you know, make greater efforts to get the kind of things that they want. And I think all that's true. If their conscious objections allowed, patients will have to travel 
maybe more than they would otherwise have to to get whatever they want. I think that's true. But in a consequentialist analysis, we have to look at all the consequences, not just some. And so what are the other consequences that would come about if conscientious objection were excluded? Well, one would be um, a lessening of the quantity of healthcare. So in the United States, about 13% of hospitals are Catholic. And I'm not exactly sure the percentage of physicians that would refuse to perform abortions, but there's many, many, many physicians that just would refuse to perform abortions, for instance. Now, if it were made the law that no hospital can operate unless it performs abortions and no physician's allowed to practice medicine unless they do that, well, then there'd be some percentage of physicians that would just have to leave medicine. They'd say, well, that's the law. I'm just not going to do medicine. But what would happen then is a lessening of the quantity of healthcare providers available. But what does that do? That harms everyone. Because if you think of health at the price of healthcare being determined by supply and demand, right? Well, this, the demand for healthcare presumably is going to be constant or growing. But the supply of healthcare would shrink if all conscientious objectors were forced, and hospitals were forced to get out of medicine. So that would raise prices uh, forever, which is uh, a bad consequence. A second bad consequence would not be the quantity of healthcare, but the quality of healthcare. Right now, in medical schools, the best students are admitted. But there are proposals that in medical schools, people should only be admitted if they're willing to, for instance, perform abortions and other services like that. Now, if that takes place, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is some students that um, would have been admitted under the old rules right now will not be admitted because they're pro-life. So they'll be excluded. So what happens then? Well, some people from the B team some people that would have not been admitted to medical school now will be admitted. But when some members of the A team are replaced by some members of the B team, that compromises quality of health care for everyone. Most physicians end up not going into the specialities that require them to perform abortions. But if some people are excluded from medical school because of their views, that can compromise medical care, not just in gynecology, but in cardiology, in oncology, in all other kinds of fields that they wouldn't be admitted to medical school for. Um, this also compromises or could compromise medical progress. So conscientious objection actually facilitates progress in medicine. I thought of three different ways. So some people objected to in vitro fertilization. They said, well, I don't want to perform that. And what that led to is the development of something called NAPRO technology, natural procreative technology. It's basically ways of dealing with infertility that um, treat the causes of infertility. And it turns out that NAPRO technology is not only cheaper than in vitro fertilization, which can run about $20,000 per try, but also it's much more effective. So in vitro fertilization fails about 70% of the time. Um, by contrast, NAPRO technology is able to achieve pregnancy about 80% of the time. So it's both cheaper and more effective to use NAPRO technology. Now, this wouldn't have been developed had in vitro, had there not been people who objected to in vitro fertilization and wanted to find a way around it. A second, object, a sec, a second uh, area of medical progress resulting from conscious objection in medicine has to do with contraception. So there are some um, physicians who object to contraception. And these physicians help develop something called natural family planning or fertility awareness methods. And it's basically where um, the uh, determination is made of when a woman is fertile, and then a couple can decide to abstain from sex during that time. Or if a couple is trying to achieve pregnancy, they can make sure that they have sex during that time. And as a result of these fertility awareness methods and natural family planning, um, now there are many, many couples that are greatly benefiting couples that struggle with their fertility because they now can determine when she's going to be most fertile and they can determine that that's when they're going to have sex. And so the likelihood of pregnancy has gone up as a result of conscientious objection to contraception. Um, a third uh, way that conscientious objection has helped develop medicine is through um, physicians who have refused to perform abortions in cases in which there's a conflict between maternal health and uh, fetal health. So in some cases, um, the recommendation is made, oh, just get an abortion if you know, there's some sort of problem with the mother's health. But some physicians refuse to do that. 
And so they develop new ways of treating these sorts of conflicts that save both the health of the mother and the health of the developing baby to the benefit of both. Now, none of these developments in medicine probably would have taken place if everybody had forced to do IVF, if everyone had forced to provide contraception, or if abortion had just been the default for these maternal fetal kinds of conflicts. Um, a third way in which um, the uh, medicine is undermined by a lack of conscientious objection has to do with the diversity of healthcare providers. So there's lots of evidence that different ethnic groups um, vary in their religiosity. Basically, in the United States, African Americans and Latinos are, on average, more religious than white people. Uh, in a similar way, women, on average, are more religious than men are. So what happens when conscience objection is removed from the table is you're going to get fewer African Americans, you're going to get fewer Latinos, you're going to get fewer women, because they are disproportionately more religious and therefore more likely to raise uh, issues of conscious subjection. You'll get a wider, uh, a maler, and a less religious demographic. And you might say, why does that matter? Well, it arguably does matter for healthcare. So let me give you a concrete example of a kind of case study. Um, let's think of a, a, an immigrant to the United States uh, from Nigeria Dr. Akenza, what we call her. And so she's an immigrant here and she works as a gynecologist in Los Angeles. And because she's from Nigeria, lots of uh, Nigerian women seek her out. They share their culture, they share um, a perspective, and the women feel comfortable talking to her. And they have a real rapport and a real, a real connection. And let's say that she refuses, because of her Muslim faith, to perform abortions. And so the law comes out, changes. Nope, all gynecologists must perform abortions or get out of medicine. And that's really what is at issue. Many people are arguing for that. If you don't perform abortions, you just have to leave medicine. So let's say that it takes place and that the law is dictating that. Well, so she loses her job. So who's hurt by that? Well, obviously she's hurt by that. So she can't support her family anymore. She loses her job. All her patients who have sought her out, precisely because she's Muslim from their native country, they have this commonality. Well, they lose the person that they trust person that they really feel open with and comfortable talking about their issues with, that patient-doctor uh, um, relationship is compromised. And does it help people who are seeking abortions? No, we're in Los Angeles. There's, I, I don't even know how many abortion clinics in Los Angeles. And within a 10-mile radius of her office, there's you know three abortion clinics. So it's not as if it's really going to increase the number of people that are able to get abortions. So basically, it hasn't helped those that want abortions. It hasn't it's hurt the people that were her patients. It's hurt the diversity of the medical profession. So lots of people have been hurt by this, and no one's been helped by this. And so this, this rule, this proposed rule, that doctors should either provide abortions or get out of medical practice is something that, in some cases, like the case I just described, is going to help absolutely no one, and it's going to seriously harm uh, a number of people. Um, so those are objections from uh, consequences. Let me just give one more. And it's objection from monopoly. And the objection goes like this. Whoever has a monopoly on providing legal medical services has an obligation to provide those legal medical services. That's a major premise. Then the minor premise is medical professionals have a monopoly on providing legal medical services. Therefore, medical professionals have an obligation to provide those legal services. Now, this argument might appear to be very strong. But I actually think both premises of this argument are false. So the major premise that whoever has a monopoly on providing legal medical services has a moral obligation to provide those services, that seems to be clearly false. As you know from the study of history, there are many times and places, like the, um, the gulags in the Soviet Union, like the Nazi camps, in which um, legal medical services were very seriously wrong. So it's not the case that just because something's illegal, that automatically means it's, it's morally permissible or even morally obligatory. But the minor premise is also problematic. So the minor premise is medical professionals have a monopoly of providing legal medical services. Well, this is, this is an ambiguous, um, uh, medical professionals here is an ambiguous term. So it could mean the entire medical profession as a whole. And if it's meant by that, then it is true that medical professionals as a whole have a monopoly 
of providing some legal medical services, such as abortion or heart transplantation, at least some forms of abortion. Uh, but from the thing that the medical profession as a whole has a monopoly, it doesn't follow, in fact, it's an example of fallacy of division, that each and every individual member of the medical profession has a monopoly. So it'd be a little bit like saying um, the US government has an obligation to you know, uh, provide social security for whatever. And okay, maybe you say, yeah, that's true. The whole US government does have that obligation. But it doesn't fall from that that each and every person serving in the US government in any capacity has an obligation to provide you know, those payments. Right, your mailman doesn't, but you know, first lieutenant of the Marines doesn't. There's all kinds of people that don't, even though you might say the whole government team as a whole does. Okay, the third and final part I want to talk about are objections from inconsistencies. So many people argue against conscientious objection in healthcare because they say this view is inconsistent. And I'll talk about a couple different inconsistencies. Um, the first is a kind of objection from religion. And they say, look, conscientious objection is about um, people of faith wanting to practice medicine in their own way, and this is inconsistent because you don't allow secular people to practice medicine in the way that they want. You're kind of carving out a special exception for people of faith that you don't allow for people that don't have faith, so it's inconsistent. The response, though, is that conscientious objection, while it is true that it is predominantly people of faith who do have conscientious objections, it's not always true, and in fact, there are atheists who have secular, non-theistic, non-religious objections to performing certain medical uh, treatments. For instance, um, Dr. Bernard Nathanson was one of the founders of the National Abortion Rights Action League. And so he's one of the people who was basically responsible for the legalization of abortion, pushing for it. He was uh, an atheistic, uh, an atheist, right? Did not believe in God, but became in about 1970, four or five or six or something, became pro-life as a result of ultrasound. So as an atheist, he objected to performing abortions. Another example would be the uh, atheist philosopher Don Marcus. He has a famous argument against abortion, which he calls the future like ours argument. And his argument goes like this. Um, you know, why would it be wrong for someone to kill you or me? Well, it's not wrong because it takes away our past. You know, our past is our past, nothing can be done about that. He said, what's wrong with it is that if you kill you or me today, we're going to lose all the great goods that we would have experienced in our future. So you're not going to have the good of, I don't know, finding the man or woman of your dreams. You're not going to have the good of um, maybe having a family or going to the movies or learning new things or whatever. All the good things you would have in the future are taken away from you. So the reason it's wrong to you or me is that it takes away a future of value. Now the same thing is true though if you kill a newborn baby or if you kill a human being in utero. If you kill a newborn baby, you're taking away her future of value. She's not going to have friends, she's not going to learn things, she's not going to go to school. If you kill a human being in utero, you're taking away her human being, her future of value. Again, she's not going to have all the goods that she would have had had she not gotten killed. So the same reason that in that the same reason it's wrong to kill you or me is the reason why it's wrong to kill a newborn or it's wrong to kill a human being in utero. So this is an argument given by an atheist. So you certainly can have secular, non-religious, non-faith-based objections to certain medical practices, for instance, the killing of innocent human beings. So it's not the case that there's an inconsistency, that religious people are asking for special pleading or special treatment. This uh, secular um, conscientious objection is just as valid as a religious conscientious objection. Uh, another argument from inconsistency or alleged inconsistency has to do with a racist doctor. The idea is, well, if you allow conscientious objection, what do you do about a doctor who is a racist? And a black person comes into the white, doc white racist doctor's you know, clinic and says, hey, I don't treat black people, get out of here, right? Or Jewish persons or whatever. Um, look, if you allow conscientious objection, you're gonna have to allow the racist doctor, the KKK doctor, the anti-Semitic doctor, etc. But I don't think that objection works either. And the reason is that Conscientious objection is about an objection to particular kinds of procedures. It's not, that's distinct from objections to particular kinds of persons, right? We're talking about rejecting procedures. Like I don't do abortions for anyone, black, Latino, Jewish. I, I don't do physician assisted suicide for anyone. It doesn't matter if they're male, female, black, Jewish, it doesn't matter, right? It's about objecting to a procedure. It's not about objecting to any kind of person, any particular kind of person. 
So it seems to me, if you, uh, if there's no inconsistency in rejecting the racist doctor and saying, look, if you're just not willing to treat black people, you shouldn't be practicing medicine. And that's a different thing. That's about rejecting persons and refusing patients. That's a different thing than refusing to do particular procedures. Um, another objection from inconsistency is that conscientious objection kind of has no principle limits. And I'll conclude with this point. The idea would be that, look, you could have conscientious objection to antibiotics, or I have a conscientious objection to giving you eyeglasses, or fixing a broken arm, or whatever. So there's no limit to it. So it just goes into craziness where you have conscientious objection to, to anything you want, just random stuff. But I'm not sure that that we have to, I, I don't think that objection actually works either. Because you can limit conscientious objection in terms of what is contrary to health. So we could define health as the aspect of human well-being or the aspect of well-being that's common to human beings and other animals that is functioning well as an integrated psychosomatic whole. Or to use a different definition of health, this one from Luke Gormelli, he says that health is the well-functioning of the human organism as a whole. Uh, and that's what we readily grasp as the good of health. Organic well-functioning is a perfective end of the human being which is <coughs> intrinsic to the organic constitution of human beings. So if we understand health in this way, you can limit conscientious objection and therefore get, out, get rid of crazy conscientious objection like I don't give eyeglasses. If you say that conscientious objection is limited to those procedures and those uh, interventions that act against the good of health. And so if you have some procedure that is not against the good of health but, but fosters the good of health, like setting a bone or antibiotics or having classes, that wouldn't count as a legitimate conscientious objection. So in other words, conscientious objection is just not anything you want. It has to do with the goal of health. And this makes sense in terms of thinking of the practice of medicine. I mean, what is medicine about? It's not about, arguably at least, it's not about just doing whatever the patient desires. There's no good physician who comes in and a teenager comes and says, hey, I want some laughing gas. I'm going to have a party this weekend. Can you give me some laughing gas? It's like, hey, cool. That you want that? Is that your informed decision? Yes, I want laughing gas. I want some, you know, um, I can just, you know, have a big party so we can use the for the party. Well, no, of course not. What is medicine about? Well, medicine arguably is about the goal of health and health objectively understood, not health as whatever the patient happens to desire. Again, to take a different example, if an anorexic patient comes to the physician and says, look at how fat I am, I really need to lose some weight. Can you give me a gastric bypass or whatever those are? Well, of course the physician's not going to do that because that is not actually the objective interest of the patient, the interest understood in terms of health. So if we think of the practice of medicine as aiming at the good of health, then we can think of conscientious objection as limited to um, objecting to providing treatments that are not in accordance with the health, with the good of health, so understood. So that limits it, conscientious objection, not to anything that anything you want, but only to some cases. So for instance, um, we can run through some of the controversial cases. Abortion is not for the good of health. Why? Because pregnancy involves two patients. There's always the mother, of course, and there's always, if she's pregnant, another human being that's involved. And so killing one of those human beings, killing either of those human beings, would be to act against the good of health. Um, physician assisted suicide, again, acting against the good of health. It is the destruction of the life of the woman who was killed. Um, in any case, what I've tried to do today is to outline three basic, uh, you might say, clusters of objections to conscientious objection. Objections that arise from the rights of patients, objections that arise from the consequences, and objections that arise from alleged inconsistencies. And if my talk has been successful, then it would follow that, um, at least among the objections that I raised, there's no objection that successfully shows that physicians ought not to have the right to conscientiously object to providing, for instance, abortion or physician-assisted suicide. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to entertain your questions.